start off with sort of like what I'm interested in is like how people get made. So I noticed that you have traveled between different continents and all this. So like, what was your childhood like? What brought you to being a curator? I am half Icelandic and half American. And I grew up between Oakland in California and in Reykjavik. My mother is Icelandic and my dad is American. And they are both artists. So I grew up with that just in my life, <laughs> always, you know, some spending time in their studios and going to art openings just, you know, from being really young. So art has always been a big part of my life. And my brother is also an artist and all my family are musicians, writers, musicians for the symphony and are artists as well. So it's always kind of been like a given in my life, some kind of aspect of creativity. But I guess growing up and when I was thinking about what kind of career path I wanted to take, I think because of my parents' background that I kind of wanted to steer away from the arts just because I think it's kind of a natural thing when you're young to feel like you have to do something that's different from what your parents do or from what you grew up with. So I always resisted it, which was quite funny and had ideas about becoming a lawyer or... So your rebellious phase was to be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and obviously that didn't work out. I think I just decided the idea of taking the bar exam was just, it threw me off. And so I started thinking about other paths. And then, you know, it just came to me that you can do what is just comes most naturally to you, I guess, but also what I enjoy the most. And what I enjoyed the most was being around art and being around artists and, and all of those things. So I went to UC Berkeley for my undergrad and I studied their rhetoric, which was a really great program. And so the rhetoric program is focused in critical writing and also has some kind of basis in philosophy and in art history and kind of film theory and, and things like that. And that was really formative and great program. And after I graduated, then I stayed in Oakland for a couple years and started working at some galleries and museums. And through those experiences, after a couple years, I decided that I wanted to go back to school and get my master's. And I ended up going all the way to Stockholm, to Sweden. <laughs> and I took master's in curating and art management there. As one does, yes. As one does. <laughs> I guess I was really trying to take advantage of the fact that I have these, I have dual citizenship. And so being able to study in Europe for free after having done quite an expensive undergrad, even though in American standards, UC Berkeley is on the cheaper side. So both this was a really amazing and pretty well-renowned program at the University of Stockholm. And so I studied there for two years and made a lot of really great connections and learned, yeah, learned a ton. And after that, I moved back to Iceland and have been living and working here since then. If I could have gone to school in Europe, I absolutely would have. I mean, the, the value for money is amazing considering it's free. Yeah, exactly. So this whole master's program was completely free for me, which was, yeah, just amazing. Yeah, the educational system being free. I mean, my God, you have the amazing luxury of being able to do that. Like, I wish I could have been able to go to, well, basically a free education pretty much anywhere because I'm still paying off my student loans at 22, no, 20, 20 years after graduation. I'm still paying off my student loans. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. And, you know, especially you have to think about we're going out into a field that is not the highest paying in the world. So that obviously has an effect on if you're going to be able to pay back your student loans after graduating. And also, I think in the arts coming out, whether it's a master's program or a bachelor's degree, that Unfortunately, the likelihood of getting a paid job and some sort of 
free work internship experience is not so high, <laughs> or, unfortunately. Well, that was really my sort of driving question with wanting to talk to you is that you are a reasonably new graduate of the arts academia. And I'm interested because I'm also a professor. So I'm sort of sitting here like part of the reason for creating this podcast was I'm a professor and I'm teaching the next generation. I didn't know how everything works because <laughs> so, I was you know, I was out of touch. So I realized, okay, I need to get back in touch with what is actually going on in order to try and educate the next generation better. And I feel like the arts academia currently is a bit out of touch and a bit outdated in a lot of its models. How do you feel? Yeah, <laughs> no, I agree with that, definitely. And I guess experienced a lot of that since graduating both from my bachelor's degree and, and then in the master's. So I graduated from my bachelor's degree in 2015, and I came out with a rhetoric degree, which I, you know, was not specifically an art history degree or specifically something directly related to going into the arts, but still was completely relevant and useful, and I use it so much in my practice today. But I've noticed that then when I started applying to gallery jobs and museums, even for, you know, quite low level positions, like say at a museum at kind of ticket desk, you know, because so I was just looking for some kind of entry <laughs> that even those jobs were not available to me and that I've had to start out the first year after I graduated, I had an unpaid internship. And that was really the only option. Also being in California, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, the competition is really high. So there's so many people vying for these positions. I do know. I got my master's from the San Francisco Art Institute. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so you come into this area of the world where there are, you know, so many creative people and so many people applying for all the same jobs. And having a bachelor's degree really didn't do much in terms of getting you positions and really came down to having personal connections, which is so frustrating, but is just the way of this world so much of the time. Yes. And it also opens up for people that have the luxury of being able to have an unpaid job for a year and still being able to survive. You know, not everybody has that ability to say, I want to pursue my passion, but the only way that I can do it is to work full time without getting paid for, say, a couple months, six months, or a year. So it's a level of privilege, I think, in the arts world that like does need to be addressed. Sadly, it's a level of privilege in general. But I mean, I, from my experiences, I feel like the unpaid internship thing is a very American model. And in Europe, I hear less and less about the idea of unpaid internships. It definitely is a much more American thing because I then came to Iceland and I was starting to apply for positions here and looking for internships or, or paid work. And I would mention this idea of I'm open for an unpaid internship, kind of expecting that that was the only thing that would be offered to me. And that was just, you know, unheard of. People would just thought it was absurd that you would work for free, which is great. <laughs> yeah. Again, one of the things that Europe has so right over America. Yeah. Yeah. So at least here I was able to get some actual paid positions and kind of start building my career from that. Well, you brought up like the term career. I'm big on that idea. And the, do you feel like, because now you've gone through bachelor's and master's, like recently, do you feel prepared for your career from the education only? Or are you learning exponentially more of things that you weren't told or don't, didn't quite understand from the academic structure? I think it's definitely really 50-50 for me that you definitely learn, you know, all this essential academic knowledge that you need to be able to 
go into these positions, but kind of the savvy that you need to kind of navigate what types of positions you want to work in and et cetera. That really came to me just from experience and just learning how to present yourself, how to go after opportunities that you want, how to kind of value yourself financially and as a worker, you know, (laughs) that totally just came from personal experience and not necessarily from the education side. Though they try to, it was quite funny because in my master's program, this was one of the reasons why I applied for the program was because part of the program was they advertised that it had a quite strong focus in business management and like teaching you the skills of learning how to manage and yeah, etc. <laughs> and then really that wasn't such a big focus of the program once I got into it and yeah, it became evident that it really is something that you just learn through practice. I have found at least in the short time that I've been working in this field. Well, it happens all the time where a school says, oh, we will teach you about these things. And then they often sort of maybe they touch on it. Maybe they like do like half a class on it or something like have half a course on it, but they, you don't actually, I feel like we're not educating our our next generation very well just period because like from my standpoint as a professor there are so many things i could offer that because of the institutional structure or the governmental regulations or the te- you know, teaching t- tests or any of these other kinds of things i can't seem to uh, elevate the education above a certain level because parts of the academic structure itself won't allow me to yeah exactly and that of course there is a value in programs being quite kind of theory driven and theory based, which is valuable in terms of just learning to talk about art in this way and writing as well, which is, I find a really invaluable tool, but it's also just as valuable to learn how to write grant proposals and write contracts and apply for jobs, you know, those seemingly basic skills that aren't so basic, really, once you start doing it. No, they're totally not. No, I hate those things. Like, I'm a practicing artist. I like being in the studio producing something. Uh, The most painful thing to me is have to write about stuff and write grant proposals and residency proposals. But luckily there are people like you who enjoy doing these things and you find it to be easy. I love it. So some some tips or tricks would be incredibly helpful. Yeah, just come, I would say, kind of easy to me just because writing is something I'm used to and is, you know, what I've studied for so many years. So sitting down and writing a proposal, although it's maybe not the most fun and kind of exhilarating thing that I can do with my time, I can get it done quickly. Well, but I find that, like, well, let, let's take grant proposals as just an example. They're very different. Like every grant is so unique in so many ways because like they use certain vocabularies, but then beyond the, the vocabulary nature of it, they also expect different things. Like my, my experience, now please tell me because I might be totally wrong on this. My experiences were in America, they sort of wanted you to be a cheerleader. They went, oh, this work is going to be magnificent. It's going to be a masterpiece of blah, blah, blah. And and you you had to like, you had to sell your work almost. And you're, you're, whereas in Europe, it's very much more of, this is what I do. It's very humble. It's very who, what, where, why, when, and, and that's it. Don't add any adjectives. Don't use any flowery language. It's just, this is what I do. Done. Yeah, I agree. I think there may be more practical or exactly just giving the information, explaining what the project's about. This need for like frivolous language is maybe not as necessary. (laughs) And I'm not sure why, why it's so different. I have to admit, I love it. Like if if I had been trained and or raised in Europe, I totally would be all in on the whole granting residency and all that system if 
they didn't expect us to sort of cheerlead for ourselves. So like that whole issue of cheerleading, name dropping, and and like, you know, like saying like, oh, I was trained by so and so and my philosophy of blah 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 and all that. I mean, that's the stuff that always turned me off from writing grants. You know, like if the if the grant writing process across the board, everywhere in the world, was just answer who, what, where, why, when, then it would be magnificent. Like, cause that's easy. Yeah. Wouldn't that be easier? Yeah, it would. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not. America's got a lot to learn. Well, America is a, a bit of a, like everything in America is a bit of cult of personality. It's a bit of, you know, who, you know, it's all, you know, friends of friends, who, who can you get to write a letter of recommendation and, and their status and all this kind of stuff that is not as important in the rest of the world. Yeah. And I really felt that, you know, growing up between these two places, I have spent maybe more time in California than in Iceland. And after my undergrad and working some years in California, I was really ready just for a bit of a break from America and just to, yeah, just a break. Me too. Oh, yeah. I left America, let's see, was it nine years ago now? And I'm still, I'm an American. I have no dual citizenship like you. I'm just an expat. I just got the fuck out and went to the United Arab Emirates for many years. And then now in, in Prague. And so like, I, I have no love loss for America at this point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I am going back now <laughs> in a month. Why? I am moving to New York, actually. I was accepted into program at the Whitney Museum. Okay, that's worth going back for. Yeah. <laughs> so I applied about a year ago and was accepted into their independent study program and curating. So I'm starting that in the fall. Congratulations. Totally worth going back for. Yeah, I'm quite excited. It'll be my first time living in New York. And obviously this program is well-renowned and and worth the move. So I'm excited for New York. Absolutely. Everybody should live, or every creative person should live in New York at least once in their lifetime. Yeah, that's what I've always felt. I've always wanted to spend some time in New York and about a year is kind of perfect, I think. Like everyone says, it is kind of a must to experience that at some point in your life. All right, moving on to the writing stuff, because you do a lot of it. You seem excited about it. So I want to know more about it because I hate writing with a passion, like holy shit. I'm happy to talk for hours on a podcast, but like to sit down and the, the problem that I have with the whole structure of like all this stuff, all of this stuff, everything, all the text that comes around the arts world is, is that like we could write eloquent 10 page things or one sentence things. But it's always like when we, when we need 10 pages, they give us 250 characters. <laughs> and, and when we could do it in 250 characters, they say, go ahead and take 10 pages. <laughs> it's just like, uh, that's true. That can be such a frustrating aspect of writing, especially for applications and grants that the kind of character and word count restrictions can often yeah, mess you up. <laughs> they the, the hardest part for me is this. They they say, okay, explain your project in 250 characters, but don't use jargon. And I'm like, but the jargon is the short way of saying this thing that would take me five thousand characters to say. If I just said it with the jargon, I could do I could fit it in 250 words, but they don't but they don't want jargon. Personally, I am happy with that to kind of reduce the amount of jargon in art writing. I think that's when we're talking about writing in an art writing in particular, say exhibition text or things like that, that that's maybe the thing I get hung up on the most or most frustrated by when I'm reading other writing is texts that are just, yeah, superfluous or, or jargony in a way that's so unnecessary. And when you try and break down the text, okay, what are we actually saying here? What is this person saying about this artwork or about this exhibition, etc.? 
that you can't really understand it because there are so many kind of unnecessary artsy adjectives that don't really do anything. <laughs> but it sounds intellectual and it sounds interesting. So <laughs> I think people have a tendency to fall on that a little too much to try and make your text sound artsy, whatever that means, instead of just keeping it simple, I guess. <laughs> Well, I think that's, there's been a change in that. Like, cause when I was a, in school t over 25 years ago now, it was very academic. Like, they were like, oh, use big intellectual words, you know, talk about Freud and Kant and you know, whatever, you know, R Roland Barth says blah, blah, blah kind of crap. And, and these days I've been finding that a lot of the encouragement that I'm hearing and even giving to people writing is – much more about like intimate uh, stories and personal connections, uh, not using jargon, not using institutional vocabulary even. Like I run into a lot of people that they describe how they produce their work, but not necessarily why they produce their work. Yeah, that's a nice kind of contrast. Yeah, and I don't give a crap about how. <laughs> no, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Well, that's, well, this is the thing. It's like a lot of people talk about like how they say like, oh, I, you know, I went out into the, I was inspired by the Alps and I went out and traveled with all my equipment and lugged it through the mountains and all. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't fucking care. I don't care about how you did it, but I care about why you did it. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't, and it's really hard to know for even for yourself why you're doing something. Yeah, that's probably the hardest question for an artist to have to sit down and, or for some perhaps, and write it down, <laughs> write it down in words. Oh, yeah. I've generally come to the position. And, and again, this is like a Europe, America thing. In America, when I was being trained, and so like, I'm going to keep going back to that. Like, so like when I was a young lass, the, they were very much sort of like, make your thing put an exhibition up, sell it, earn money, and then reinvest that in making more work. So, so it was all about creating a product and then convince people to purchase it so then you had money to make more. In Europe, I find it's literally the exact opposite of that. You come up with an interesting idea and you get somebody to fund the idea. And so then by the time it's actually produced, it's already been paid for so selling it is irrelevant and it's just about the the principle of pr creating something new i love that so much yeah exactly and then it's not based in this idea of needing to sell for it to have value or to be able to continue working in what you're doing or what you're producing i know i'm so sad i was born in america yeah iceland is an interesting place to be kind of in this context, because it's so small, obviously. So there are kind of unique pluses and challenges that come with that experience. <laughs> Do tell. <laughs> well, if I would talk about maybe a positive for me as a young person who's kind of starting out in this field, I think having been here in Iceland when I'm having these what can I say, kind of starting experiences that will hopefully propel me forward in the next years, that because this is such a small community that I was able to get much more meaningful positions and experiences and opportunities professionally that I don't think I would have had the chance to back in California, just because the competition level is so much higher. So like I was saying, just getting hired, like at the front desk to sell tickets was just a massive ordeal. <laughs> and so like steps of progress become so much harder or slower, unless you're just really well connected and really great at networking and have that just yeah built in network already in the States I'm talking about. <laughs> but so coming here to Iceland, because it's a smaller community, also the way that you network maybe doesn't take as much effort, doesn't take as long, because like the 
number of key people that you need to meet, et cetera, are much fewer. All of those things kind of factor into being able to apply for opportunities and being, for me, much likelier to get them at a younger age than I would have in America. I really don't think I'm 28 years old now. And I have had a few museum exhibitions here in, that I've curated here in Iceland and other gallery exhibitions. And I also started my own home gallery that I started in my living room. All of these things I highly doubt would have happened for me at the same speed, I guess you can say, if I'd been in America this whole time. So <laughs> I think that's a good positive, that then I can take these experiences that I've had and take them now abroad. So now if I'm applying for positions, say, wider in Europe or in America, I have this CV and level of experience that is going to help me get positions that I maybe wouldn't have as quickly, or hopefully, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm hoping (laughs) it'll help. (laughs) Oh, no, I totally agree with that whole perspective because you would never have had the chance to put on an exhibition at any museum or any, I should say, large museum in the United States. But, I mean, coming from a smaller community, like it's much easier to get those things. I mean, like, I, yeah, you would never would have gotten those opportunities in Oakland for sure. No way. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I was some superstar. (laughs) Well, unless you were related to some superstar. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) But, okay, I also was reading a a little bio about you, and you you said these words, which I'm sort of fixating on these words, and I find them fascinating, which is you have the idea of deinstitutionalization and the removal of spectacle from art. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that? So I think I can maybe talk about this home gallery that I created kind of in relation to this. And I also wrote my thesis, my master's thesis around these ideas. So I was, I've was been recently quite interested on you know, how we can experience art just at a smaller and quieter and more intimate level rather than you read this word spectacle. And I feel like many times when we're visiting exhibitions and these kind of blockbuster, massive scale exhibitions that happen in more major cities across the world, that there is this level of kind of wow factor and intensity and almost celebrity around them that can perhaps be kind of distracting to how we experience art. And that that doesn't just relate to the large scale of the exhibition, but also just to the architecture. So like the massive architecture we could talk about around some of these world famous museums like the Guggenheim or, or places like that, that the architecture itself can also be really impacting or distracting on how we're experiencing whichever art exhibition we're talking about, the house in that museum. Well, that sense of spectacle is also something that I feel like it's, it it also sort of gives us a sense of you're supposed to appreciate something. So like if there is some massive, you know, like when I was a kid at this, I grew up near the Smithsonian in Washington, DC, and they had the Vermeer exhibition. And so of course, like it was this incredible exhibition. And so it was this weird expectation that you should be sort of like awed by this thing because it was this amazing thing. And the, like, I mean, it was a good exhibition. Like I, I'm not questioning that, but like, I don't know if it was like, a life-changing exhibition kind of spectacle-y kind of thing. But there is this sense that like these, these kind of expectations that are, that are built around these big exhibitions then become a thing. Like I know, I know some people that like went to the Guggenheim, like you just brought up and they're, they're expecting like it to be this like reverential sort of like spiritual experience to be there. And they got there and they were like, yeah, it's a nice building. But but there's those expectations that come with these spectacles that then become a difficulty because like people are often felt like 
well, I'm supposed to be awed by the Guggenheim, so I'm going to act like I'm awed by the Guggenheim. Or I'm supposed to be awed by this this exhibition at the Tate Modern, so I'm going to act that way. So like, it's it's a difficult sort of issue of like expectations of how people are supposed to engage with things. Yeah, it's really a defining factor in how you experience art in these spaces. And also kind of introducing, in a way, like performatory behaviors, because like you're saying, people enter these spaces and feel like, wow, I should be wowed. I should be, because it's in this space, it's amazing. And I need to act that way. So I started thinking about how would, say, a Vermeer be experienced in, if it was hung in someone's living room, you know, how does that change the way that we experience just personally and interact personally with that artwork? So those are kind of the themes that I wrote my master's thesis around. Well, especially when it comes to something like a Vermeer, because like that was originally painted to be experienced in a home. It was not painted to be in a white cube, sterile environment. Like it was, that is the original intention of that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was writing my master's thesis and at the same time, I had just come home to Iceland and I was writing my thesis here in Iceland, and I moved into this warehouse space because I was looking for a space to live, and so I moved into this weird warehouse building that was had other family members that lived there with me, and it was in this kind of odd neighborhood here in Reykjavik that it's just industrial buildings that are that are used for like car repair shops and things like that. So it's not a neighborhood where so many people live. And I had this raw, big open space that I was just living in and just got this idea. Hmm, this room here looks like it could work well for an exhibition space. And so I just decided to go for it and started make it into exhibition space that functioned both as my living room and then on one side and on the other side was exhibition gallery <laughs> and I started putting on shows and having openings and yeah I did that for about two years I think I love it when I did my master's thesis what I, it was a very personal set of work that I had created and when I put it on exhibition in San Francisco I actually did bring my sofa and my coffee table and uh, my chair and, and a rug and everything, because I figured if people were getting inside my head that much, that they should also be in my living room. Hmm, I like it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was a lot of work for sure. And also just gave me a more realistic perspective on what it means to run a gallery and to run your own art space, because I maybe always had this fantasy about or not a fantasy, but just this idea that in the future I would try and start my own art gallery. So I thought this would be a good first step, trial experiment. <laughs> and yeah, running a small space out of your living room, even that is a lot of work. <laughs> so what are your takeaways from running that? Or do you still have that dream of running your own gallery? I think now for the past year, I've been working at one of the main commercial art galleries here in Reykjavik as their associate director. And through that experience, also just seeing even more, just being involved in kind of all of the aspects of running a gallery had really opened my eyes to just the level of obviously dedication, but just like, there's an Icelandic word for it that I'm trying to think of in, in English, but just level of like hard work, that, <laughs> that's not the right word, but I am, still thinking about it <laughs> if that's the right path for me <laughs> opening a gallery i mean <laughs> opening a gallery is no no small feat for sure but but there, again like in europe there's lots of financial support and in iceland i would imagine there is like financial support for like artist run galleries and things like this that is not available in lots of other places in the world yeah exactly when i started this space my home gallery, I did like a crowdsourcing fundraising. I was able to raise some money to help with the starting funds. And I also 
applied for grants that I received. And so all of those things were super helpful and make a reality. And then COVID came along and the idea of having openings and kind of art events in my personal living room just stopped being feasible. So that is the main reason why it it came to an end for now. (laughs) Well, going back to that term about deinstitutionalization, give me some more understanding of that. Flesh out that idea for me. I guess mostly I'm just thinking about how we can present and experience art outside of just a museum and a gallery context. So whether that means in a more performatory context, in a shop, on the street, things like that. And also just outside of the constraints of institutional structures. I think this also for me in a way relates to race and kind of built inequalities that are institutionalized in that sense. So it's also like institution in terms of museum and museum as an institution, but also kind of institution in terms of things that are institutionalized and systemic in terms of inequality. Oh, yeah. Oh, the the arts world's institutions are based on white, male, Euro-Americans. Yeah, exactly. Like that is just built into the history of the art institution. So I just think it's important to keep that in mind in all aspects of what I do, that this system isn't one that was really built to include me uh, or people like me. Just to be clear, because this is an audio podcast only. So like, what is your racial background? Yeah, so I'm half African American and half Icelandic. So that, yeah, has obviously influenced me in my path. (laughs) And the things that I find important to pursue and and call attention to. Okay, I find I'm I'm a white American man now living in Europe. So I'm, I'm more or less the establishment. So help me out. Like, is having these non, uh, I don't even know how to explain it, like non-traditional elements. So like being African-American and being Icelandic, are those beneficial to you uh, to to bring in some sort of fresh perspective or new ideas uh, and, and or like have any opportunities been available to you that might not have been available to you had you not had these uh, traits? It's a difficult thing because it's kind of both. Just to take in my personal context right now, I've been living in, here in Iceland the past couple of years and in most of my work experiences, whether I'm working in galleries or in museums, I'm really the only, if not one of very few brown people that I encounter in my work. It's a shock. No, you don't say. (laughs) So when I'm applying for things and say, you know, I'm applying for grants, and this is a conversation I have had often with other people of color that It's often a question for me when I'm applying for grants or things like that, whether I put my picture, because at the same time, I don't want to be offered something just because I'm a person of color, because that's kind of like you're only choosing me because I'm filling a category or I'm, you know, taking a box instead of the value of the work that I'm presenting. But at the same time, I think it's also extremely important for people like me to have more visibility and to be offered those positions more. So it's complicated. And it's something I am yeah, conflicted by whether you take advantage of the fact that many people or that many institutions are like trying to fill this diversity checkbox, <laughs> you know, <laughs> It's frustrating. <laughs> oh, it's completely true. I mean, I, I actually, there was a time I was up for a, a position as a dean of a school, or I don't remember what, maybe it was head of department, I don't know. And they interviewed me and they, they all say, oh, we love you, we love you, we love you. Unfortunately, we can't hire you because we have to hire a woman. 
And it was just like, oh, okay, well, that, yeah, that happens. So, I mean, it, but so what kind of resolve have you come to? So like, do you include photos? Do you, do you, you know, it, it is a difficult thing. Like, it's, like I was in the Middle East and I was teaching female Muslim women, sorry, female Muslim, that's repeating myself, Muslim women to be artists. And they often would like put in the forefront, my artwork is about my life as a Muslim woman. And I kept trying to encourage them not to put that in the forefront and make it so they're not automatically being defined by that. And some of them did it, some of them didn't. And don't get me wrong, there's you know various successes and failures between both choices. So what kind of like decision have you come up with? Like, are you including photos or not? I haven't really decided yet. I do both, I guess. <laughs> but when I like, I think it also just depends on the project. Say I'm applying for something or I have this, I have an idea that it is based on the idea of race and racism and inequality that then yes, I do because it's relevant and important. My background is kind of, for me, essential to the idea. So then I would say, as a woman of color, I'm writing this proposal that deals with XXX, because obviously it's read and interpreted differently than if I was just a white woman, you know? <laughs> it, it is awkward when a white man or woman d puts in a proposal saying, I want to do this thing about racial issues, even though they're white. And it's just like... It's so important to me. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. It's so meaningful to my life about the plight of the not me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I guess that would be my answer to that, that when I feel like it's relevant and important to the project that I'm working on, that then I, I put it at the forefront. Yeah, because I mean, you and it sounds stupid, but it's sort of a superficial thing. But like your name doesn't give away anything really about you it doesn't give away iceland it doesn't give away african-american it doesn't give away any sort of thing about your name is you know daria soul andrews like you could be you could be you know irish for all i can tell with that last name like it does give away the fact here in iceland that i'm not fully icelandic and that obviously has kind of effects on yes because it doesn't end with daughter yeah exactly yeah so that's the one thing it gives away. <laughs> yeah. It gives away what you're not, but it doesn't give away what you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Now, okay. So again, going back to like that, you're young in your career and you're going to the Whitney, which is fabulous. So exciting. But so the question then is sort of like these days, because again, you, like you're just coming out of school it's a shitty, shitty time in the industry because of COVID and everything like this, for sure, for everybody. So like, how has that affected your, your prospects slash like career plans? I think I've always been someone that like, regardless of the situation, regardless of the pandemic, et cetera, you know, I'm always thinking ahead i'm always applying for things i'm always you know, looking for the next step like applying to a bunch of things at once so that really hasn't changed for me and always just thinking of different and new exciting opportunities places that i could live abroad and work at the same time things like that i guess it maybe had affect the pandemic at least that i have been here longer kind of continuously than perhaps I would have otherwise. You know, usually while I'm here in Iceland, I travel a bit more and I go back to California more often. So it, in that sense, kind of forced me to pursue an opportunity and be more stable here, which has been a good thing in some sense that, that I was able to get a really great opportunity at this gallery that I work at now, which will yeah, just be a positive thing for the future. But also in terms of the pandemic, that I was kind of in a COVID rut when I applied to the Whitney, <laughs> which was quite funny. And I applied really with zero expectations of anything coming from it because it is 
kind of prestigious program and I was just feeling kind of COVID down, I guess you could say, and decided to just go for it. And then because of the pandemic, nothing really came from it for a long time because the program was postponed until the next year. So what about career goals? It's like, like it's, I mean, you, you mentioned the idea of opening your own gallery. You're currently an independent curator. Like I have this belief, this is going to sound so bad. I apologize for this, but I go with the idea that independent curators are curators who simply haven't gotten the opportunity to work at an institution. Yeah, I feel you. I mean, at this stage in, in what I'm doing, obviously working at an institution would be a great experience for me. And this is, you know, something I'm striving towards. And um, not to say that that is necessarily the end goal and is what I would do for the rest of, you know, my quote on career, I guess. But I am striving towards that at the moment, but I also really enjoy the freedom of working as an independent curator and being able to pursue projects that most interest me, although it's not the most stable. And so that's something that's also just that for me, I have to take into account and has to be something that I think about. So trying to find like this, I guess what's most important to me is finding this balance between having some sort of stable position that also allows for some freedom, which I guess is what so many people ultimately want. <laughs> so many creative people ultimately want. My wife is an accountant. She does not desire that. <laughs> she doesn't have the need for that freedom. <laughs> not really. Not as much as I do, for sure. Yeah, yeah. So that's also just what I'm trying to figure out personally, like over these next years, I've been having a lot of um, different professional experiences and each one of those teaches me something about, hmm, okay, this is what I want. This is what I liked from this experience. This is what I didn't like from this experience. And I take that into kind of the next steps in terms of thinking about the next opportunities that I pursue story of my life like I, i've gone through so many internships and jobs and career changes like the one thing i can tell you is what i don't want to be doing anymore <laughs> yeah i feel that <laughs> yeah I, I know lots of things that i never want to do again yeah i definitely know now what i don't want to do and i'm sure i'll as the more experiences i get i'll learn more about what i don't want to do but also what is important to me <laughs> at the same time. It starts whittling away the things, that, the other opportunities until you're like, well, I'm really only left with this. Guess I'm going to do that. <laughs> and now, now we just hope that there are jobs for that. Yeah. But I also have thought about teaching. I think, you know, say down the line it would be more kind of qualified to be a professor. I guess you could say that that's something that does interest me. And I think I would enjoy it is enjoyable. I love teaching. I hate meetings and academic uh, administrative bull bullshit. Like I have this belief that, that there should be this separation within the academic structure. There should be teachers who are excellent people in the classroom teachers and give them like 80% of their workload in the classroom and only 20% meetings and other stupid stuff. And then there are other people that love meetings <laughs> and you know administrative crap and all this kind of stuff and give them 80 percent administrative works and only 20 percent in the classroom because the fact that they try to make people who love and are very good teachers make them do this stuff that they're not good at and then these people who are really good administrative people and put them in a classroom more than is necessary and there may not be as good in the classroom i think is a a difficulty in the whole thing where they try and basically say like, everybody's got to be doing the same amount of stuff. And I'm like, but not everybody's as good at all these things. Yeah. That's quite counterintuitive. <laughs> well, unfortunately I'm talking about like universities. I mean, smaller schools, you know, private schools, art schools might be a little bit different. Maybe they do that, but big universities, they try to be equal and fair. And I think in the end it is, unequal and unfair it doesn't end up working out that way <laughs> no that's my soapbox for the day 
All right. I'm going to your thing about being a curator. This is a, I have some general things that I always love to hear from curators, which is like, how do you find ideas for exhibitions? I guess just through kind of like personal reflection. So for me, at least recently, my exhibitions, I want them to, I guess it's kind of cliche to say, have some kind of message. But like, for me, there are things that are important to me in my life, politically, socially, that I want to try and affect some change in. And for me, the only way that I know how to do that is by producing an exhibition that hopefully brings some people to it that will change their mindset and have some kind of ricochet effect that will cause some change. Wait, I should I should differentiate because there's a difference between curating a group exhibition versus a solo exhibition. Right. So in this sense, I'm talking about curating a group exhibition where I have a specific kind of idea in mind and then I would start by going out and just doing lots of research. You know, I research a lot and I'm researching artists that interest me both by going to exhibitions here in Iceland, trying to attend like online talks for things that are happening in Europe or in the US that I can't physically attend. And whenever I go places, I try and try at least to connect with connect with artists that I find there. So it's a lot about also kind of just personally connecting with people and then you learn more about their practice and wow, that's really interesting. I would love to work with you on that. And then at least when it has to do with group exhibitions, then those pieces kind of start coming together and that's how an idea forms. And then I would start by writing. So for me also like writing is kind of the beginning step for me that I start writing out my ideas letting them flesh out and just have this kind of writing process, maybe for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and then see where that leads me. All right. And of course, as a practicing artist, all of us are always wondering, how do we get on the radar of a curator? I've had recently more artists that contact me and just ask for a studio visit or want to have a phone call or that maybe have heard about me or worked with someone that worked with me that are visiting Iceland and contact, hey, do you want to meet up for a coffee? Things like that. So I think from those kinds of interactions, then, yeah, in the past, through those kinds of interactions, I've ended up working with those artists because they got on my radar, I guess. And also just from my personal experience, when I was in my master's program, I met so many artists through the program. And a lot of those artists have been people that I've come back to and will come back to in the future if I haven't yet. So again, it comes back to kind of personal connection with a lot of, not personal connection, but just like, yeah, you know what I mean? I do. Networking, the people you've met and all this kind of stuff. I know it's it's so sad yet true. I mean, but that's true in every industry, you know, like everybody, you know, any new job offer you get, no matter what industry you're in is generally because some friend recommended XYZ job to you. It's not, it's very rare that you just get a job randomly. Mm -hmm. Though I do, I have in the past done, you know, been researching artists online, found someone I'm really interested in that I have no connection to at all and just send them an email, you know, they don't always respond. <laughs> Wait, artists don't respond to curators? That's ridiculous. Maybe, we, I don't know why, but yeah, okay. some people I have reached out to just from doing research online and have contacted them. And yeah, I get responses sometimes, not all the time. Not sure why. <laughs> That's very weird. All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you as well. Thanks for a nice chat. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this conversation. I enjoy asking stupid questions to smart people, and I've learned so many different things about what I've done wrong and what I can do better in my career. And I hope that this podcast has inspired and assisted you in becoming more successful in your creative endeavors. 
If you like the podcast, we would appreciate a five-star rating and maybe a nice comment would be greatly appreciated. I would like to thank Todd FF for writing a review and giving us a five-star rating. Thank you, Todd FF. Please tell your friends to listen and subscribe also. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We are produced by 5014. The audio was edited by Jakub Czerny. And the music was created by Pete Bybee. Thanks, Pete. The Wise Fool is supported in part by an EEA grant from Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway in an effort to work together for a green, competitive, and inclusive Europe. We would also like to thank our partners Hunt Kastner in Prague, Czech Republic, and Kunst Centrene in Norge in Norway. Links to EEA grants and our partner organizations are available in the show notes, or you can find more information about the podcast on Instagram at the wise fool pod or our website wisefoolpod.com